Well, good evening, good evening. The one and only, he says. Some people might say, thank God there's only one. Isn't that wonderful music tonight? Isn't, isn't that going to be a great album? That's wonderful, isn't it? I love to see the young people up there. Somebody asked me, he said, are you going to go up there and jaw? I said, it's in my heart. It's not in my hips. But I saw Sister Katie right up there, jumping up and down. I said, man, if she was as old as I am, she wouldn't be able to do that. A young woman like that, she can still jump around. You know, I was the president of two different universities over the space of 16 years, so I saw a lot of young people. And I thank God for the energy and the, the joy, the, the, just the cranked up energy they can have. And there's all the mixed stuff going on with young people. You know, and that, that's, I like that. So they're worshiping, you know, but there's always that guy, you know, and he says, look at that blonde over there. He's up. <laughs> you know, I can praise God just as well here as I can over there. You know I'm telling the truth. Well, it's fun to be here. You're a jolly crew. Thank God every one of you is here. If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn to the book of Ephesians, the first chapter. I'm going to be reading there from in just a moment. Well, we're continuing this. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of, of teachings, sermons, whatever you will, which are simply put uh, about theology, specifically about the nature of God. Now, if this is your first time, you haven't heard the other three, you're, you're perfectly okay. I, I've tried to make each one of them a standalone uh, event, but there is in the, in each of them, and there's one more next Wednesday night. Um, and there is a theme, a, a, a motif, but each one is standalone. What if, what if we come to in the last few weeks? First, God is holy and that his holiness is not our problem. Our problem is not the holiness of God. It's the sinfulness of man that the purest expression of God's holiness is love. God is I am, is holy, is love. Second, that God summons us to holiness and that the spirit of God, the finger of God, changes us not by adherence to the law on the outside, but by transformational grace and redemptive process on the inside. Third, that God is good and therefore his will usward must be good as well. The will of God is, is a good will. And tonight is the power of God. This whole series is meetings with God. Now, I just was undertaking something in this series, which was to teach some kind of little more depth, deeper theological teaching without sounding deep and theological. So we've tried to spice it up a little bit with these skits and some other ways, but, but the fact of the matter is people say all the time, you hear people say, I'm no theologian. I'm no theologian. I'm no theologian. All they mean is that they're a bad one. Theologian, a the theology just means what you believe to be true about the things of God. And in this series specifically, not just the things of God, but the very nature of God himself. Theology, theos meaning God, the study of God. So it's a wee bit redundant. But in this series, we're talking about the theology of God. If you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter one, I'm going to begin reading at verse 15 and then read right on to the end of the chapter. Ephesians chapter one. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks unto you, making mention of you in my prayers. And here is the prayer, starting with verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, let me just pause. Please notice what Paul is saying. I'm praying that the 
that the God of our Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And what will that reveal to you? The knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And verse 19, this is the key verse. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward? who believe according to the working of his mighty power. You see the, the repetition that you would know the exceeding greatness of his power. How would you come to know it? By the working of his power. So in other words, the greater the power of God that works within you, the greater you reveal the power of God. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he, God raised him, Jesus from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenlies far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I, I read a passage of scripture like that. Does the same thing occur to you? How full of the revelation of God must a person, a human being be under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to write a passage like that. Whew. Put your hands on your Bible and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the next few moments, we pray that you will enliven our hearts and quicken our minds that we may receive all that you have for us that we may, according to this passage from your word, have our minds enlivened, our spirits opened, our intellect quickened, that we may comprehend with all the saints the breadth and depth and length and height of your power, which is revealed in the love of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Here, here are a quatrain of mistakes that people make when they think about God, mistaken views of God. One is two different kinds of idolatry. One kind of idolatry is to worship something other than God, a golden calf, an idol of some kind, to worship anything other than God. And God meaning the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the God of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the only true God. Now, I, I, I know this is going to be controversial. I, I've struggled in my spirit whether to say this, but I just want to say this to you. And I, I, I think it's important that it be said. The word Allah is not another name for God. It's another God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel is God and the only true God. So one kind of idolatry is to worship something other than God. But there is a subtler and more dangerous kind of idolatry, and that is to worship God other than as he is. I'm going to be dealing with next week, next Wednesday, I guess this is a I'm fishing for you to come next Wednesday. I'm going to be talking about remaking God in our own image. I want to deal with the perversions of the goodness of God. Then, then there is this other couplet of bad theology, and that is, one of those is that God is evil, that God is a bad God because there are bad things that happen in the world. In other words, to blame God for the evil that's in the world. We're going to deal with this tonight. And then a subtler and I believe more dangerous form of that is to say that God is not evil, but he's irrelevant. Another way of saying that is that God is dead. When I was in uh, seminary at Emory University, just uh, when Lincoln was in the White House, there was a, <laughs> it was kind of a, a, a rage of liberal theology at that time. And there was a professor that was at Emory at the same time I was there as a student. Uh, his name was Thomas Altizer. And he made uh, something of a, a ripple in the pond of contemporary 
uh, erroneous theology by writing a book uh, with the uh, exciting title of God is Dead. And it caused a little stir as those things do and then they melt away. And... But I, I remember during that time, it may surprise you, but the funniest graffiti in the world is in the men's room of a theology school. Up over one of the urinals in the theology school, written in blue ink, it said, God is dead, signed Thomas Altizer. Right underneath it, written in red ink, said, who is Thomas Altizer? Signed, God. I guess I could have told that same story without using the word urinal, but it just seemed <laughs> important to include the context. So let's deal first of all in reverse order with these two tragic misconceptions of God. The first is the irrelevance of God. This in, in the irrelevance of God, when people talk about the irrelevance of God, they see God and therefore the religion of God as confused and useless. An old God, a leftover, a relic, an antique, if you will, from some ancient time. Perhaps at one time he was powerful, they think, once. Maybe he created the world, maybe he didn't. Maybe he worked miracles in the past. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he sent the plagues on Egypt. Maybe he freed the Hebrew slaves. Maybe he parted the waters. Maybe he turned the river Nile into blood. Maybe he fed the Hebrew children in the desert with manna. Or maybe he didn't. But if he ever did, they say, he doesn't do that anymore. And they see God as a confused, senile old man. Here's the first meeting with God. Oh, oh, oh. I, I, I didn't see you there. <laughs> you didn't see me. Aren't you, aren't you, aren't you, aren't you God? God? I am? That's what they told me. Oh, well, if you say so, it must be true then. <laughs> have to forgive me. Old noggin here ain't what it used to be. Can't remember things quite the way they were. Right. Uh, anyways, um, my name is Wilson, and, uh, I'm here because I... Wilson. Yes. Wilson. 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 Huh? <laughs> Robert Wilson, your father, Robert Wilson. No, no, my, my dad's name wasn't, uh, that. No, my dad's name was actually... He was uh, a gardener. Yeah, a gardener. Wait, he was a general. No, no, uh, uh, a preacher or something like that. Huh. Uh, look, uh, about my prayer. Um, well, I, I, I need help. Um, you know, I'm okay. So my family is Watkins. Watkins. Your name is Watkins, isn't it? No, my name is Wilson. We went over that. But anyways, my prayer. Okay, so. Uh, my... Hey, have you seen any angels around here? Uh, no, I. No, I haven't seen any angels around here. I have no idea where I put them. Where you, where you put them? Oh yeah, I, I just, uh, I don't know for the life of me uh, where they are. Okay, uh, look, I, I don't mean to press here, but I kind of want to get to my prayer. Oh, why didn't you say so? <laughs> All you got to do is you just write your prayer on an index card there and put it in the prayer box. Okay, well, I, um, I don't see any...
cards or a prayer box. What? What? Wait. What? There's the index cards. I don't know where they are. Or the prayer box. You, you hadn't seen it, have you? It's a great big box. It says prayer box in rainbow letters all over it. You didn't see any angels come in here, did you? Oh, for Pete's sake, you already asked me that. Oh. Uh, this is useless. Hey, hey, I, uh, well, suit yourself. Uh, hey, what was your name again? Winters. That's it. <laughs> I never forget a name. <laughs> Wait, where are you going? The problem is that that's about the God that many people believe exists. A God that may have some significance in history, that may have performed miraculously, but they do not see him as active, energetic, and capable as God now. We must understand who God is. If God is I am, he is never relegated to history. He is the God of now, and his power remains undiminished. When we forget God's power, when we cease talking about God's power, then we, we begin to believe that God has forgotten us. We make him irrelevant, and therefore the worship of him becomes hollow and stupid. If God is not powerful, then why is he worth being worshiped? In fact, that's the very origin of the word worship, is the assignment of worth, like leadership or statesmanship or churchmanship. Worship means the assignment of that which is worthy of being adored. Without power, God is simply a religious artifact. As a result, Without power, we lose the fear of God. Without power, we may enter actually into rebellion against God. We come up with self-made solutions because we doubt God's ability to fix it. And it fixes on us an anger and frustration that is the result of blaming God for what we have done ourselves. The greatest and darkest of all of the temptations of, relevating, of relegating God to an irrelevance is witchcraft. Now, that, that may surprise you. Why is witchcraft so evil? What makes it evil? It is a means of supernaturally bypassing the authority and power of God. If God is powerless, if God is irrelevant to my immediate circumstance and I cannot fix it myself, then I am tempted to reach into supernatural sources and find some way to bypass a powerless and irrelevant God, which leads us to a fascinating question. Why does it say in the Old Testament that rebellion is like unto witchcraft? Because rebellion is an effort to relegate natural authority to an irrelevance. I will bypass natural authority. I will rebel, make my own way, live in disobedience because I push my natural authority aside and access my own plans some other way to supplant an authority which I have decided is irrelevant. And therefore, rebellion is the bypass of authority just as witchcraft is the bypass of supernatural authority. The worst part, perhaps, though, is not really witchcraft. It is blaming God. If, if God is powerful and he does not fix my every situation, I have a crisis. I have a need like Wilson here or Watkins or Winters who comes to God with some kind of a need. If I see God as senile, forgetful, irrelevant and powerless, then I become angry at him because he lacks the power to change my situation. At least he doesn't change my situation. Maybe he has forgotten me. Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he's gone senile. 
Maybe he is weak where he used to be powerful. And therefore I begin to get angry with God. But if I say to myself, God is all powerful. God is almighty. God is, is, has the capacity to fill me with fear and with awe and with worship and to adore him. And he has the power to fix any situation in my life. And he doesn't. Now I'm faced with a theological question. Is God then good? If he could fix every situation in my life and he doesn't, I can be angry at God. You could fix this. I don't know if you remember the scene from the magnificent musical Fiddler on the Roof, where Rev Tevya is coming in from, the, from his milk rounds. And uh, just as he gets near home, his horse goes lame. And you remember, he looks up to God and he says, this, I didn't have enough. It's not enough that I'm poor. It's not enough that all my children are girls. It's not enough that I have a scolding wife. It's not enough that I live in poverty. It's not enough that I live in a tiny little village in the middle of anti-Semitic Russia. That's not enough. You have to make the horse lame. Well, you see, that blames God. And if we see that God has the capacity to fix my every situation and he doesn't, now I'm angry at him because he is not God the way I want him to be God. Now there is another issue. Not that God is irrelevant or powerless, but that God is actually dead, that he is gone, that he has disappeared from the scene. The three men that I admire the most, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost caught the last train for the coast. <laughs> the fruit of a misspent youth. That's the fear that God is actually dead. The problem then, if God is dead, we begin to substitute our own golden calf. We are far too sophisticated a, theocracy, a technocracy to actually worship the statue of a golden calf. We find other idols, fame, money, political power, our own race, our own intelligence, our own selves, sex, something. And so that we actually create a God in our own image. The strangest fruit of all uh, of this kind of understanding of a dead God is actually the creation of formal religion. As 2 Timothy 3, 5 says that it engages in religion, but it denies the power of that religion. Hi. Oh, yes. Um, can I help you? Uh, yeah, I am. I'm actually here to, uh, to see God. So. Oh, oh yeah. um, well, uh, well. Uh, well, what? Is, is, he, is he here? Uh, can I see him? Well, this is awkward. You see. Uh, no, I, I don't see. It's, can I meet with God or, or not? Well, look around you. You are in the first funeral home. Here we talk about God. We sing about God. And then afterwards, we eat. It's all very nice. Sounds pleasant. Uh, look, I, I just came to, um, to actually uh, meet, uh, meet with God. Is, is, is that, is that oh, possible? Oh, that, is, that is impossible right now. Why? Um, uh, it's what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. We are in the first funeral home. Oh! Oh, you mean... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh. God is dead. I performed the funeral myself. It was a uh, rather dignified occasion. I'd rather like to say that the uh, ceremony was quite moving, if I do say so myself. 
Okay, wait. So if God is dead, then why do people keep coming here every week? Well, I suppose that the uh, very idea of God is quite comforting. Wait, the idea? Well, you're telling me that God isn't even real? Well, it depends upon your definition of the word real. For example, uh, how you feel about uh, Valentine's Day is real, or how you feel about puppies, or how you feel about a sunrise, the one this morning, for example. Uh, perhaps that is uh, what you're looking for. You see, God is in all of those details. But he's actually dead. Uh, yes, if you want to put it that way, God is dead. Okay, well, I'm out of here. I came to meet with God, not attend his funeral. Oh, so sad. He's obviously still grieving. It takes many so long to get over the grieving process, but at least there's one thing that we all have to look forward to, and that is Sundays. Oh, I love Sundays. Hallelujah. There's uh, much talk about the Greek word koinonia. Koinonia means, uh, loosely translated, uh, community, fellowship, our, our, our union. But if you take a living Christ, a living God out of that, we simply create a kind of a religious country club. The community of God without God is actually a community or a koinonia of death. I am not in this sermon attempting an ontological argument in favor of the existence of God. For me, for believers, and for the Word of God, that is a given. It's settled. God is, and God is powerful. I'm building from the immutable truth that God is. From there we ask, if he is and if he is all-powerful, if he is the miracle-working God of the Bible, and he is, if he is neither senile nor dead, then these questions arise. Some claim because the world is sinful and confused, it must be because God is sinful or confused. Some argue that because evil exists in the world and because it is not entirely defeated, unwound miraculously, that God is too weak and powerless, that Thomas Altizer is in some sense or another right, God is, as the funeral home director said, dead. But these things we know. Paul the Apostle said in Scripture, in the book of Ephesians, I pray that the Holy Spirit will grant you revelation, that you will come to understand the power of God, the power of God, the goodness and power of God. We don't order God around. We don't direct God which miracles when, but we know that God is all powerful and all sufficient. The three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace the king said, can your God, is your God powerful enough to save you? Listen to their answer, because their answer is perfectly theological. God is, and he is powerful enough to save us. But they said, he has not revealed to us what he's going to do in this situation. But they said, let it be clear, even if God doesn't work the miracle that we would vote for right now, we're still not going to worship your idol. When we bring into the, these two realities into confluence with each other, that God is real and that he is powerful and that he is good, then I can trust him and believe him that he will in every situation do that which is the best for me. God is real and God is good and God is powerful. How do we answer those two questions then? The world is confused and evil, not because God is senile, confused and evil. The world is confused and evil because humanity is confused and evil.
The world is, evil is not existing and continuing to exist because God is impotent to resolve it. God is alive and all powerful and will in the end resolve all the confusion, judge all the sin, wipe away all the tears, lead us to a new and perfect existence with him. In the meantime, why doesn't he just fix it now? Because he is giving this dark world out of his grace, time to repent, time to seek him, time to awaken. It is not that God is powerless. It is that God holds back his power, waiting against the day when there will be no more repenting, when there will be no more changing, when there will be no more time. And God will resolve it all. When I was in India, there was a little boy that was killed, murdered in a horrible way. His uncle cut his head off and buried his body under the corner post of his new house. Because uh, in his religion, sacrificing a little boy, his own nephew, under the corner post of that house would make the blessing of the gods of the, Hebrew pan of the Hindu pantheon uh, to bless that house. There was a big trial and a Hindu jury acquitted him. He killed the boy. He murdered his own nephew. He cut his head off. He buried him under the corner post of his house and he was acquitted. And I was with a group of Christians and they were just enraged. And I remember one man saying, he got away with it. He got away with it. I said, no, he didn't. They said, he'll never face justice. I said, oh yes, he will. They said, he, he's going right on being blessed and the curse that he's going to bring that blessing upon that house, he should be cursed. I said, he is cursed. They said, he should die. I said, he will. God will make it all right. He withholds his power. He is not impotent. While he waits to give humanity time to repent and prepare, holding back his power, we resolve in ourselves that God is awesome. That he is awesome. Having said, as I began this, I spent so much of my life with young adults. I, I love them. I love the college kids. I love you. You need more adjectives. Get, get a thesaurus. Reach beyond awesome. College kids, everything is awesome. How was the hot dog in the college cafeteria today? Awesome. Tell me about your girlfriend. She's awesome. Really? Because that means your girlfriend and a hot dog are at the same level. <laughs> Try for some other adjectives, expansive ones like good. <laughs> but there is one for whom the only appropriate word is awesome. Our God is an awesome God. Awesome in power. Awesome in love. Awesome in holiness. Awesome in grace. Our God is an awesome God. Come on, let's stand up and worship God. Our God is an awesome God.
want the band, if you'll hold, and let's just hear the words. Now sing it, state it in the face of your need, in the face of a challenge, in the face of what you're struggling with. I will not bypass God. I will not come up with my own solution. I will not dismiss him as irrelevant and senile. I will not think that he is dead. I will not think he's impotent and powerless. My God is an awesome God and he can fix it for me. If he delivers me from the fiery furnace, I know that he's a God of power. If he chooses for me to die in that furnace, he is still awesome and good, and I still will not worship the world. Now, just your voices. Lift your hand and just your voices, and let's sing it together. Just the voices. Our God is an awesome God. God is a powerful God. Amen. Now I want you to remain where you are. I'm going to give you a blessing and a benediction as we leave. Rest in the confident knowledge and assurance, not only of the goodness of God, but of the power of God and that his goodness and power are usward, toward usward, as St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter one, and that the Holy Spirit will continue to reveal to us his power. Now, I'm going to say the benediction. I like to stay and shake hands with you. I'd love to. I'm sorry to tell you, I have a flight tonight and I'm going to head to the airport and claim that great Bible verse. He confuseth mine enemy and blindeth the radar screen. <laughs> Lift your hands up and receive a blessing. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and stand you before his own presence without fault and with unspeakable joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, who is immortal, invisible, powerful, almighty, and usward in unbroken love. To Him be all glory, for He is a God of power. God bless you and good night, everybody. God,